All right, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> we're grateful to be with you today. We tell you, welcome, 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 welcome to Soul Food at Noon. Now, I'm your pastor, teacher, Pastor Jay. I hope your week has been wonderful. I hope that you and the Lord have had some wonderful times together and that you have grown in Him and understanding that He loves you so much that you're now experiencing a freedom of living that you've never experienced before. We thank God because we know that He is absolutely a God of power and a God that loves us. Today, as we continue with our Power of the Gospel series, we're going to talk about the dynamic of grace. And we know that many of you that may be listening to us, you already understand it, uh, understand grace, and you you truly uh, are living by it. But I found that many of us do not truly understand it, and, uh, and we need a revelation of the grace of God so that we will stop living and start uh, uh, stop trying and just begin to just be what God has called us to be, knowing that he has already provided the way. All right, if one word could be found to define the whole flavor of the gospel, it would be the word grace. And in Acts 20, 24, Paul summarizes his whole ambition in ministry. When he says these words, he says, however, he said, I consider my life worth nothing to me. He said, if only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. And the whole thing, when we read in, uh, in, in Romans 6, 14, uh, that's the whole reason that we have been set free from the slavery of sin is because we are not under law, but we are under grace. What exactly is this grace? Why is it so important to the gospel? What does it mean practically for me uh, as I face the issues of day to day? The meaning of grace, my brothers and sisters, to understand how grace works, we must understand what grace is. And uh, grace, you may have your own definition of it. And you may have other uh, uh, learned from others. So you, if you have one, you, you work with that. But today, uh, we're going to grace, as it's used in the Bible, it has many shades of, of, of meaning. But there are two principal meanings that bear uh, directly on our walk with God. Number one is undeserved favor. Uh, when you read, let's let's go read. Let's go and read Ephesians. You know, ain't nothing like you know. We get ready to eat some soul food right now, so that's a we got to go get in the word so we can get get some eats. Uh, right here in Ephesians two, we're gonna start at that fourth verse. It says, "But God, who is rich in mercy, glory to God, for His great love." Wherewith he loved us. The Bible says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up to set together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace ye are, are, are ye saved through faith. And that out of yourselves it is a gift of God. Amen. Now we want you to understand then that God's grace. Grace is nothing more than or less than God's mercy in action. He extended salvation to us, not because we were in any way deserving. I know a lot of times you know that if you 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 we 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 if we don't want to get sidetracked, that you know that you know that there was something 
in me that made uh, 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 God move. Uh, dear hearts, there is nothing in you or me that calls God uh, to, to move on our behalf. Nothing, no matter what one song say or not, there was nothing in you or me that calls God to move on our behalf. We, there was nothing, not because we were any way deserving, but simply because he loved us is the reason that we uh, 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 can be called the sons of God today. Grace is a characteristic of God's love, not, not a characteristic of anything within ourselves, good or bad. But the impact of God's grace on our lives is profound. Because of God's grace, if you read the scriptures in Ephesians 2 and 3, we have been switched from objects of wrath to being objects of mercy. The second part of, of the of meaning of grace is the enabling power. I want you to go to Acts. The fourth chapter Glory to God. Hallelujah. The fourth chapter, we're going to look at the 33rd verse. And it says, And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord, of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. In other words, grace is not just God's undeserved favor saving us from the consequences of sin, but it's also God's enabling power to enable us to live a spirit-led life. And we must remember, a spirit-led life, the Bible says, that, that anyone that, uh, uh, those that are led of the spirit are the sons of God. And so that means a spirit-led life means that that you have matured to be an adult son from being a child. You have matured to being an adult son because the, the, the adult son are the ones that are led, not dictated by the Spirit, but led by the Spirit. Uh, and uh, so grace is the enabling power of God in action. It is the action of God's Spirit in our lives, empowering us, empowering us to do what we cannot do for ourselves. Combining these two meanings, grace can be defined as God doing what we did not deserve, God doing what we were incapable of doing ourselves. All right? Here we got the gospel of grace. You have the old me. The old me needed God's undeserved favor. But on this side of the cross, the new me need God's enabling power. Both of that is grace. So the first meaning of grace is God's undeserved favor. It is encapsulated in the first half of the gospel, the part that deals with the, with the old me. In this usage, uh, the opposite of grace is debt. Okay? And the old me owed a debt and grace paid it. The second meaning of grace, God's enabling power, is encapsulated in the second half of the gospel. Remember how we had separated and we are in the second half of the gospel. That's what we're teaching now, the part that deals with the new me. In this usage, usage the opposite of grace is self-effort. All right. Sometimes the Bible uses the word grace to embrace both of these meanings. And so, which represents the entirety of the new covenant. Okay, but grace is the opposite of law. Now, so, throughout the New Testament, you will see these three opposites, debt, self-effort, or, or works, and law, constantly contrast in the way of grace. One is called worldly wisdom, while another is called the wisdom of God. One is called the old way of the written code, while the other is called the new way of the spirit. So, the fact of the matter is, let us go to uh, 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 Romans 11 and 6. 
write things down. And if you're just now tuning in, we say we thank you for tuning in to Soul Food at Noon. And uh, hopefully you can get some, uh, get some good sustenance uh, today. And that sixth verse, it said, and it by grace, then it says, we're talking about Romans 11 and 6, it says, and then by grace, then is it no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. In other words, one of the things that in, in, in the child of God has to come into a uh, uh, understanding uh, they need a revelation from God for us to realize that we are no longer in debt to God. <laughs> you and I, we are no longer in debt to God. Uh, that's how come they, they sing the song that, that he paid a debt he did not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. And that is the absolute truth. Uh, that we, 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 we are not required to attain the standard of God's holiness through our own effort. And, 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 that, uh, and that the entire nature of our relationship with God is now based on the covenant of grace. God's undeserved favor. God's enabling power. Understanding this grace is it, 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 vital uh, 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 how the gospel is to be lived out. <clears throat> In other words, before I leave there, you, you, we had a debt with God that we could never pay. I want, I want us to just take a few minutes here. So Christ paid that debt full on the cross. Now, there is no longer any debt that is hanging over your head. I want you to understand that, children of God. No debt is hanging over your head. Your Christian life, then, is no longer debt motivated. It's grace motivated. This is the wonder of the gospel. In other words, you only have one remaining debt, outstanding debt. And that is to love those around you in the same way that God has loved you. That is that, that if we have any kind of, of a debt. So if someone was thinking about a pastor, the Bible said that we ought to owe no man nothing but to love him. Oh, yes. And the reason is, is because if you, matter of fact, let's, 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 let's read this so you can see, so you can see a, a little bit about what this grace is. I want us to read 13, Romans 13 and 8 right quick. Let you see this right here. It's, so, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. Hallelujah to God. Uh, for Listen to this. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Good glory to God. And in other words, saints of God, we don't owe a debt. And, and if we want to talk about keeping the law, and, and people only thank God that says, love one another. Matter of fact, I can stop right there and tell you, you know, that we just read all of the commandments. And if you love one another, the Bible says that you uh, 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 have kept all of the commandments. But isn't it wonderful that Jesus came and he kept them? And the only thing we must have to do is have our faith in him. This is what we're talking about, grace. And uh, uh, because you need to understand grace so you can understand how the gospel has been designed to work in your life. And uh, 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 Paul and other leaders of the first century church constantly battled those who thought grace was a, 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 a time for them to go, well, you know, sin. In other words, uh, oh, wait a minute, you know, if, if, if grace is so much, and uh, 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 
then it's time for, you know, if the more I sin, the more grace abound, then uh, 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 maybe then I need to go sin some more so grace can abound. No, uh, this is because uh, people have misunderstood the nature of grace. They thought God's grace simply meant he turned a blind eye to sin. Far from it, brothers and sisters. However, God's grace is actively dealing with sin in your life. In other words, God defines, grace defines the Christian life and energizes your walk in the spirit. Grace means God is at work in you. Say it with me. God is at work in me. I may not feel like it. It may not look like another folk looking at you may not see it. But you have to know that God is at work in you. Why? Because grace says so. Grace doesn't mean trying to draw upon your limited resources of strength and wisdom to live a life that is pleasing to God. Rather, grace is drawing upon the unlimited resources of the Spirit of God to live as God intended you to live. And you must do that by faith. Now let's go to Colossians 1 and 6. And uh, I believe uh, we're going to see some truth here that's going to be precious to us. Colossians 1 and 6 says, which has come to you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. The Colossian Christians had grasped from the beginning God's grace in all of his truth. In other words, they begin to understand the basic elements of God's grace and all of his truth. In other words, God's grace is undeserved favor. Okay? Then uh, that's the first pass of the gospel. God's grace is enabling power. That's the second half of the gospel. God's grace as the new covenant is the entirety of the gospel. Now, this, even though we may understand that, it does not mean that we have exhausted all of God's grace. No, grace has not just been given to us. The Bible says that grace has been lavished upon us in abundance. I'm talking about in abundance. And another thing, once we know then, grace is free. This truth is, 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 is a classic statement in, in Ephesians 2. 8 through 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. Now, free means that no charge at all, no strings attached. Suppose I invite you to dinner, and we have a great evening, but when you get ready to go home, I surprise you with a bill <laughs> Of $50 for the meal. Alright? Our relationship probably keep, probably changed drastically that day. One of grace to one of obligation. The meal would no longer be a gift of grace. But merely a service for which I charged you a fee. Okay? In other words, one of the things that uh, when I was uh, looking at that, a lot of times, have you ever seen you going to some of these fast food restaurants? And the modern marketing cleverly mixes law and grace. I want to show you something. For instance, they say, if you buy one, you get one what? Free. That ad isn't really a free offer at all. It's not really a free offer at all. Because if it was truly a free offer, the ad would simply say, get one free. That's what made grace so marvelous. It's absolutely free. God has given it as a gift to you. Hallelujah to God. And the thing about it is that when we receive this grace, 
we begin to understand that God, there's a love, a level of, of love that God has for us that we're still, still uh, 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 going to be all eternity trying to understand and grasp it because it's just that powerful. Let's read Romans 5, 1 and 2. Glory to God. Thank God for the grace of God. Five, uh, chapter Romans chapter 5, 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's just powerful right there. Peace. Peace. There is nothing hanging over your head between you and God because of the finished work of Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Now, grace is the, now is the basis of your entire life with God. It's not just a doorway into salvation. It is a state in which you breathe. It's a state in which you live. It's a state in which you stand. In other words, my brothers and sisters, we must understand that as Romans 6.14 tells us in this verse, Paul says, he makes a bold statement. He says, sin is no longer your master. And the reason it is no longer your master is because the dynamic of your life has changed. You are no longer under law. You know, self-effort, trying to, to keep a set of rules. And, no, you're not under that. He says you're under grace, undeserved favor and enabling power. Okay, now you must understand then. When we look at this, you may ask, so how can we truly experience this day-to-day -day victory over sin? Because I want you to understand something. Grace can be risky business. Oh yeah, that's how come some people just don't, they don't want to preach it. Because, see, a lot of people think that, that they seek to live the Christian life by the works of the law. Don't do this. Don't go there. Don't this. Don't. Don't. Okay. And, and, and that's because they are, they are confused. One of the things about 2 Peter 3.18, Peter says this to us. He says, and it's important to realize that grace that saves us is not static. In other words, Paul says, grow, I mean, Peter says, grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace not only saves you for heaven, but grace equips you for a life of spiritual growth and maturity right here on earth. It's important that you understand that because you must understand that any leading that is going on in your life are uh, 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 God speaking to you to, to lead you and to guide you. The guidance is a means to an end. Remember, everything God does in your life and in my life has one end in mind. And that is to conform us to the image of his dear son. And so the, uh, 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 what you don't have to worry then is about having to find some spiritual experience that will take you higher or deeper uh, than the grace that saves you. No, God doesn't have anything higher or deeper. I'm going to say that again. God does not have anything higher or deeper uh, uh, than his grace. What we need to do, we need to just, uh, to, uh, 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 we just need to discover how high and how deep that grace is. And, and this is going to take us eternity, uh, us to do that. How many times that you must understand that uh, if you was to go buy a car, and many times you can go and you can get the economy car that only have certain things that come with it, uh, then you can go up to another package that comes with uh, a little bit more things you can enjoy, power windows, uh, air conditioning, cruise control, then you can go to that car that has the whole entire package 
Well, their heart, that's the one that we have with Christ. God has given us. We have the entire package. Now, walking in grace, we want you to go to 1 Peter. We want to look at something here. 1 Peter 5. Oh, 1 Peter 5. Let me find it. Let me find it. 1 Peter 5. 5 through 6, it says this. Uh, likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisted the proud, and give grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Uh, let, while we're there, let's go ahead and read James. Uh, let's go back and read James uh, 4 and 6. But he giveth more grace, in other words, he giveth more undeserved favor and enabling power. All right? Uh, 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 the word for he saith, God resisted the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now, in other words, God is looking for a worshiper. Now, now this, is, this is how we're going to walk in this grace. Is that God is looking for a worshiper. Alright? Because in other words, I will not be able to walk in this grace until I will submit to God. To God. And that is the absolute imperative that you must understand. Why? Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace unto the humble. Now, what does God mean in the terms of proud and humble? He's not using human standards to measure people. What we call humility can sometimes be what the Bible calls false humility. In other words, let's have a quick look at uh, what false humility is and what true humility is. False humility is, is, is a belittling of yourselves in the eyes of others. You know, you know, I just, you know, I, I'm, I'm just a, a sinner saved by grace. I was a sinner saved by grace, but I'm not that now. No, stop calling yourself that. The Bible don't call you that. The Bible now calls you that you're a saint. But we use that to try, you know, uh, 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 but here, when most folks say that, they don't realize that the focus is still strongly on yourself. You are either the center of attention, and, and you're still the center of attention. The false humility, in fact, masks religious pride. That's what it does. True humility is an attitude toward God, and not just toward yourself, uh, 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 and not just toward yourself. It acknowledges this: that only God can save, only God can empower a person to live a holy life. You can't do it. No matter who, how saved you think you are, what background you come from, you cannot live this holy life. Where you thinking that you're keeping it, uh, you got it together up here, I guarantee you fell in over here. Somewhere you either sinning in, 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 in word, uh, uh, in thought, or in deed. That's how come you got to understand God is saying, shift the focus off of you trying to live this life and because and shift it to me. Because remember, anytime you think you can do it, it put, let me put it to you this way. Anything that you think that you're doing that's causing you to be right with God, dear heart, you're still under self-effort. You're under what we call the law. And guess what? You are nullifying the grace of God in your life. You may think because you ain't doing this and you ain't doing that and you wearing this and you, you're saying that, that it does not make you no more closer to God. Why? Because you're thinking that you are close to God because of what you've done. And listen, everything that you do concerning to make you right with God, God says is like a filthy rag. In other words, there is nothing that you can do that will make you pleasing to God except 
receive what he's done for you through his son Jesus Christ by grace. See, pride is self-centeredness. Thank God for grace. I'll tell you, I thank God. Because many times we, 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 we call ourselves being humble and it comes in a form, a pure form of ego, ego, egotism or more a self, a poor self-image which poor self-image is, is, is simply wounded pride. In other words, it may express itself in outright arrogance or just false humility. Pride by its very nature draws attention to itself. Look what I've done. Look what it is. And then anytime you think you did it, you have, then you will know what follows. You think that you can look down on somebody else that ain't keeping your set of dues and don't. Oh my God. If that ain't Phariseeism. And God is looking at you and saying, hold on just a minute. You have not come to understand that, that there is nothing about you that will cause me to love you even now. If it was not for my son dying on the cross and me giving you the gift to be able to stand in this grace with the gift of faith. And he said, I did it. So you can't boast because you ain't done nothing to cause me to love you. All saints of God, receive the finished work of Christ. Receive it. God's undeserved favor and his enabling power. I love that. Notice then that a lot of times, uh, 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 on one hand, at the core of the grace and power of life, you will find humility. Not self-centered humility of the self-righteous person. The person that thinks that you didn't did it all right. You know, you got it right, everybody else got it wrong. Who in the world? Was, who, who thinks that? Who? But you got a whole lot of folks running around here because they were this denomination or that denomination. They think because they got it right and everybody else got it wrong. Do you not realize God ain't did none of that? None of it. Because no one can say, can put God in a box and say, he acts like me, and I did, and though he acts like me. God said, no, I sent my son. My son acts like me. My son is the express image of me, and I declared that I accepted him. And the only way I'm going to accept you is your faith is in what he's done for me on your behalf. Glory to God. You can't point fingers. If you're saved anywhere, it's because God did it. It ain't because you're doing anything. It's because God did it. Do it, Son, Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I'm grateful today. I'm so grateful. In other words, I want you to understand the gospel is based upon genuine humility. That humility expressed in the recognition, I cannot save myself or change myself. I am incapable of pleasing God in my own strength. I'm incapable of doing that. And that's how come it was so risky. Because the Bible talks about the, the risk of grace is that some will try to take advantage of God's goodness. But God is willing to take that risk. His grace is so marvelous that God will give it to us and endure the pain of us misusing it. God is willing to take the risk of saving us freely, then having us to forget how great the gift of salvation really is. Oh, I see somebody looking at that. I want you to go over to first Peter. I, uh -huh. Yeah, Father, speak to me. I'm going to show you this in the scriptures. Go to 1 Peter 1 and 9. Glory to God. 1 and 9, it says, Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your, 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 uh, 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 no, uh, no, that's not what I wanted. That's not what I wanted. I want 2 Peter. That's what I want here. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. In other words, you didn't do nothing to purge yourself from your old sins. It was a gift that God sent his son to die for us. It was a gift. And we, we must stop and, and, and don't forget that the reason that you 
you are a child of the Most High God, it's because God has declared you that. Not because of something, a do, a don't, or some doctrine that this one speak, that this one don't believe. Saints of God, you are saved because God has chosen you to be saved and then gave you the gift. Glory to God, I tell you, I feel Jesus right now in order to live for him. I love it. I want you to go to Titus 2. We're going to, uh, we're coming down to a close here. I tell you, God is just wonderful. I love the way that he loves us. And he loves us. Titus 2. I want us to look at something here. 2, 11 and 12. It says, For the grace of God that brings us salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us, denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Uh-oh, now we're talking about the discipline of grace. In other words, uh, uh, under, now that we understand the dynamic of grace, it works, it, it, uh, it works and it is vital that we are to learn how to walk in the spirit. Some Christians think that grace means that you're now just to sit back and let God do all the work. Oh no, this could be further from the truth. You just read it. Notice what Paul says. Paul says in, the, in, in those verses, who is it that is to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions? It's you. Who is it to live a self-controlled life? It is you. What makes the difference, however, is God's grace. In other words, God will give you the grace, but you must choose not to. In other words, you must choose to live the self-controlled life. God will give you the grace, but you must say no to ungodliness. God is not going to say no for you. He will give you the grace, the unmerited favor, and the enabling power to say it, but you must choose to say it, to say no to ungodliness, to say no to worldly passions. In other words, God has designed grace, his enabling power, to empower you to live in accordance with his will for your life. There is still an active response on your part. But the difference is that now it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. Sometimes when we look at that, it is wonderful. God's holiness the standard of holiness for our lives has not changed. In fact, if anything, the standard of holiness expressed under grace is higher than that expressed under the law. Uh, and you can see that, you know, when the Bible talks about, you know, Jesus said that, you know, it has been said that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say if a man looks up on the two lusts after her, he says that. Okay, so we see what has changed, however, uh, is the dynamic which the standard of holiness is attained. We're called to be strong in, in, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, saints of God, grace is the framework for living. When you submit to God's grace, you step into a disciplined lifestyle. Your life, our daily life, is disciplined by grace. It's disciplined by, this discipline involves an effort that is applied by you within the boundaries of God's grace. The Christian life does uh, uh, involve effort. And, 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 and us getting to that, uh, uh, the question then would be, Pastor, can you, the question is at the issue, it's the direction which that effort it, it is applied. You must understand something. When me and you, uh, 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 God, the Bible says that he is working uh, uh, us, uh, in us, the will and to do. And so you, you, you may be thinking, well, you know, that this, this life of, uh, um, of grace seems passive. But it's not children of God. It's not passive. I want you to look at it like this. Uh, uh, when the Bible says... That God, God uh, wants us to to, look, uh, to 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 understand that we do have a responsibility in this grace. So, 
The Bible says in Philippians 2, 12 to 13, it says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not, uh, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out quote, your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who has at work in you both to will and to work of his good pleasure. In other words, this passage, you need to read it all the way through because if you quit in verse 12, you may get the idea that the Christian life depends on what you do. No. But the only reason we can work out our salvation is that God is working within us. In terms of our daily life, verse 13 actually comes before verse 12. Since the key to this is what God is doing in grace. Everything we do is simply an expression of his work. Let me show you something. Do you not know that it's not your nature to study the word of God? No, my brothers and sisters. No, when you pick up that Bible and you start studying the word of God, you must understand the reason you're doing that is because you are abiding in the vine and that's part of the fruit. You think that you just decided to do that. No, that's a good work. That's God. You thought you're the one that got, gave yourself the hunger to want to study. No. That's God working in you the grace. And the only thing you're doing is simply expressing the, uh, what he has worked on the inside of your glory to God. Works and grace are mutually exclusive when it comes to salvation, but they have an important relationship in the Christian life. When grace is at work, the work we do for the Lord are inspired by and enabled by grace. <laughs> See, a lot of times you, you, you think when you can love your neighbor, you must understand something. That's not for you. You couldn't do that. That's grace enabling you to do that. Isn't that powerful? Glory to God. See, it's not that we're working to gain God's favor, but we're working out what he has worked in. Okay? To put it another way, both the Old Testament and the New Testament commands us not to lie. Amen? The difference is that the law states it as a command, period. The command is just as strong under grace because God's standards does not change. But because we are operating under grace, God's command becomes an opportunity to display his character. Okay? Now, uh, uh, the, uh, the character uh, of, of Christ through us. And as we draw upon the power of God within us, we can display it. This is how we activate the gift of grace for daily living. Gifts don't just materialize out of nowhere. A gift requires a giver. There is only one giver great enough to give us a gift as wonderful as grace. And that's nobody but Jesus Christ himself. You understand that? I'm telling you, saints of God, the power of, 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 of God that is working in our lives is absolutely so powerful that you have to understand that as we work, as we work and we move here on the planet, we, you, 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 we work with God. And you must understand something. We, we, you got to just say, for instance, that you, uh, your, your car was stuck in the mud. And then all of a sudden you pushing it, you can't get out. But then here comes a strong man with big muscles and he comes and he says, I'll help you get it out. And you go back and start pushing and you look up and the big fella just standing there with his arms folded. And you ask him and say, okay, aren't you going to help me? He's going to tell you. And then he looks at you and says, oh, uh, you are pushing the wrong way. You need to get back here and help me. And both of you get there and push and then it comes out together. You come, that's you working with God. You're working. Well, no, what did you do? You decided to obey. You're working with God. 
And see, that's that balance, my brothers and sisters, of walking uh, in cooperation with God instead of working against the grace of, uh, of God. You're now working in relation to what God is doing. And it's powerful in our lives because we're no longer under grace. You must understand the power of grace never runs out. Never, saints of God, it never runs out. No, because as long as you abide in the vine, you, you can put it this way, if a grape was on the vine, you never, uh, you never uh, uh, hear a grape talking about, a, I sure wish I could become more graper. No, it, because it would become everything it's supposed to if it just abide in the vine. It will become the grape. And that's the key, learning to abide in the vine. That's the kind of relationship that God wants us to have. In other words, in other words, when you receive the gift of God's grace for daily living, you no longer just pray, Lord, I don't want to tell a lie today. But Lord, I give you the freedom to express your truth through me. And so in other words, grace gets you beyond praying, Lord, I'm going to try not to yield to lust today. Instead, you're able to pray, Lord, by your grace, I will allow you to express your purity of my mind, of mine, through me today. When you start living like this, you begin to experience the grace of God. It's not so much, okay, Lord, no, I'm going to allow you to, uh, to work out uh, uh, what you done worked in. But that, that means that I must cooperate with the spirit of the living God. That's how come you got folks that's keeping all kinds of do's and don'ts. And if you look at them and tell the truth, they're some of the most meanest, the most nastiest, prideful folks. They negative. They, can't, they don't see nothing good except in their little group or whatever. Saints of God, God did not call that. That's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ realized if I'm anything, it's because of Christ. Not only do I do what he wants me to do, but I also know the reason that I did it, he gave me the power. He told me, he said, listen, I want you to love your neighbor. I want you to love your enemy. Okay? But then he turns around and says, oh, let me tell you this. I'm going to give you the power to do it. So I'm not trying to figure out how I'm going to do it. I'm just going to rest that God is going to live his life. That's the power of grace. My God, there, there's nothing like grace, the saints of God. The Christian life works on the basis of our cooperation with God instead of working with God, working the same direction with him. And another thing, you cannot, saints of God, there's the reason there is no boasting in God's grace. The gospel totally excludes all possibility for human boasting. This is so intrinsic in the nature of the gospel that it cannot be overemphasized. I want you to go to 1 Corinthians. We're coming up. Now we hope to God that you've learned some things today. Take these scriptures. Go ask God to give you a revelation. Because there can be no repentance or change of mind if there is no revelation. And so we need revelation in order to change. Where there is no revelation, there will be no change. So we have God give me, if you don't understand, Lord, give me revelation of grace. And in, in, in 1 Corinthians 1, 26, it says, For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confine the wise. And God has chosen weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. In other words, God, the, the, the gospel is God created the gospel in such a way no one may boast before him. No one. You can't say because I done this and I done that. Honey, you cannot boast because if anything good is coming out of you, it's because of the grace of God. Then Paul goes on to say something that's very unusual. When you look at the 31st verse 
of that same verse, uh, chapter, he says that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Paul says there is a kind of boasting which is allowed. Boasting in the Lord. Paul, uh, 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 let's go to 2 Corinthians 12. Just a few more minutes here. Uh, we're trying to feed you some good soul food at noon. 12 uh, at 1 through 2. Uh, uh, 2 Corinthians uh, uh, 12, no, I mean 12, 9 through 10. It says this. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was ch uh, chargeable to no man. For that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied, and in all things I have kept myself from being. Uh, is this what I'm on? Am I in the right place? No, I'm in the wrong. I'm sorry. That's not. That is not what I wanted to read right there. I want to. I was in the wrong place. No, the ninth, uh, twelve nine. I was reading wrongly. And he said to me, "My grace is sufficient for thee." For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecution, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But I want you to understand, Paul gladly boasts not about his strength, but about his own weakness, for it was the sole sufficiency of God's grace that enabled him to live for God. Saints of God, you cannot have a revelation of God's grace without gaining a burning desire to boast in that grace. When our boasting is before God, we call this praising God. When our boasting is to other Christians, we call it encouraging. When I'm encouraging others, I'm boasting in God by the grace because I'm encouraging them through the scriptures and what God has done in my life. When I'm boasting is to those who have not yet discovered the grace of God, it's called witnessing. God's grace is moving toward a goal in your life and in my life. And that goal is the full likeness of his son. Jesus Christ. Saints of God, uh, be, be blessed. Thank God for his grace. Stop worrying and allowing the enemy to speak to you. You're carrying around shame and guilt. Allowing folks to tell you you ought to be. Listen, stop allowing folks to tell you anything. Take your cue from the God that is on the inside of you. And when it's time, remember, he works it in and then he turns and gives you the power to work it out. That's grace. My brothers and sisters, I tell you, I'm grateful today for the grace of God. We hope that you have learned something from today of the dynamic of grace, undeserved favor, and enabling power, which I dare you to just simply become a worshiper. That's all. Just become a worshiper because that's what God is looking for. God is looking for worshipers, people that's going to put him first. Remember, your whole life on the planet is for one thing, for God to get the glory out of it. And he has determined how he is going to get the glory out of your life. But he says, we are workers together with him. Uh, today has been a great day for the power of the gospel. We want you to know that we have a, uh, we have a website, www.lewisjackson.org. Uh, please go there, connect with us there. We also have YouTube where uh, right now, I think this is the 15th lesson that we've been uh, taught on the power of the gospel. And so we have a, a YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. And there you can go watch all the webcasts uh, of, of uh, uh, Soul Food at Noon. We also have a Facebook page. And uh, if you have not liked our page, please like us today. We want you to know that God loves you. And saints of God, listen here. Remember, God's love for you is greater than any condemnation. God is greater. Because if you allow him, 
He will bring you to what he has destined you for. Today is a great day to go out and let somebody know that, you know what? I love you. Go ahead and give somebody that love today. Go ahead and do something great for somebody else so God can do it for you. If you ain't got enough to take care of what you need to take care of right now, I dare you to go take what you got. Ask the Holy Spirit, who are you to sow it in? And when you give it to them, God says, what you make happen for someone else, God says he'll make happen for you. We don't say this every time that we're together, but we do have a, a, a place on the, the website that if the Lord is laying on your heart to donate to Lewis Jackson uh, uh, Ministries to help us continue to, to uh, get better equipment so we can serve you and serve those uh, in, in the United States, but also those who may be watching us that's in other countries. We have had some people that from Africa that has been looking. Uh, and if you feel like that God has laid on your heart to donate to this ministry, we have a donation page uh, where you can donate on our website. We will be grateful to you. We want you to know that we love you. We are here to help you, to serve you, and to add value to your life. To let you know unequivocally God loves you and that he wants you. And that you are valuable to the kingdom of God. As Pastor Jay, your pastor teacher, it's been a pleasure to be able to talk to you again. I want you to know the first lady and myself, we're grateful that you have tuned in to us. And we know that and it's our heart. We pray for you. And the United Christ Church family do too. We love you. We bless God for you. This Sunday, if you don't have a place to go, uh, come to our service. It starts at 1230. And if you can't make it, Tune us in on United in Christ Church uh, Facebook page. You can see the whole service live and, and begin to grow in uh, your walk with God. Until the next time, be blessed. And this is Soul Food at noon. Pastor Jay is out. Be blessed.